Okay, today we're going to be learning Yevama Daf Kaf. We're continuing on in our in our Rabbi Shimon Rabbana Machloket about Esh Dachiv Shalayaba Olamo, and then we're going to get off into a new Mishnah and other topics. So we finished off the Daf with this Rav Menashe Bar Zvid comes along. Okay, maybe we'll do a brief review, and I put a chart at the top of the sheet. Um, about the machloket between Rav Oshaya and Rav Papa, about Rabbi Shimon and the, Rabbi, the rabbis, which you can kind of review, which is basically Rabbi Shimon holds, again, generally we say if a woman's married to her husband, her husband dies childless, she falls to Yibam to whatever brothers are alive at the time. And she can't fall to Yibam to anyone who wasn't alive when he died. That's Esh Tachiv Shalaya Balamo. And that's because it says, Ki Yeshvu Achim Yachdav. The whole Yibam Parsha starts off with when brothers sit together. That means they had to have been alive at the same time. According to the rabbis, once this brother, let's call him Levi, was born after Ruvain died, she's never going to be permitted to him. The whole Eshet Ach that we permit because of Yibam, which is normally Erva, right? You can't normally marry your brother's wife is going to be overridden in general for Yibam, but never in this case. If he wasn't alive in the time of the brother, Yibam doesn't apply. It will never apply. It doesn't matter how many other brothers of his she marries and who all die childless, she will never be able to marry Levi. Do Yibam with him, right? Obviously never marry him. Only Yibam would be allowed. But again, Yibam is a type of marriage. So, But Rabbi Shimon disagrees. And Rabbi Shimon says, and his whole logic, and we saw this at the end of yesterday's stuff and also before that, which is, since he was born to her, and as he was born, Levi was born in a time when she was already disconnected from Reuven and connected to Shimon. Now, we talked about two different possibilities, Rabbi Yoshaya or Rav Papa, whether as soon as Reuven dies, she's already linked to Shimon because Zika, or maybe only once she does Yibum with Shimon, okay? Whichever way we go, which is really the general way we go, is the second option, which is only if she already did Yibum with Shimon. Since when Levi was born, she was married to Shimon, so she's already considered like Shimon's wife. And therefore, Rabbi Shimon says, sorry for the confusion of Rabbi Shimon and Shimon, but Rabbi Shimon holds that she's okay. You can almost remember it this way because Rabbi Shimon holds Shimon is Right? It's all viewed through the prism of Shimon. So when Shimon dies, we don't really care about Yibum, what happened the first time. The Eshet Ach becomes permitted because as soon as Shimon dies, his brother, who he was alive with at the time, can do Yibum with her, no problem. So Rav Menashe Zvid sat in front of Rafuna at the end of yesterday's death and said, what's the reason for Rabbi Shimon? And the Gemara says, what are you talking about? What's the reason for Rabbi Shimon? We already know the reason for Rabbi Shimon. He said it explicitly. So then he says, oh no, what they, what he, he must have meant, the Gemara fixes his question and said, what Rabbi Menashe must have really meant was, my time de Rabbana. What's the reason for the rabbi's opinion? And then we said, what's the reason? Because it says, u'lekachalo li'isha v'yibma. That's in the Yibum Psukim. It says he takes him for a wife, for her for a wife and he does Yibam with her. Now, after he takes her for a wife, she's already married to him. Why does it say Vibma? That word is unnecessary. They use a word with a Yibam root in it to say she still got the Yibam of her first husband upon her. Words, even when she marries Shimon, she still has this connection to Reuven, in which case she can never marry his brother that wasn't alive at the time that he died. So then they say, okay, wait. And we only started the question. We kind of ended mid-question, which is, I'm now at the last line of Yutetim Abed. The fact that it says in the Mish, in Mishnah, once he does Yibam with her, Shimon does Yibam with, with Ruven's wife, she is like his wife for all intents and purposes. But I'm Rabbi Yossi Bar Hanina. What does this mean? So Rabbi Yossi Bar Hanina explained that this means, Melamed Shemigal Shabiget, if he wants to divorce her, he can divorce her with a get, meaning she doesn't need chalitza from him. Okay, you might have thought maybe she's she needs to do yibum with him, and therefore if he wants to get rid of her, you know, divorce her, whatever, it's not a nice word I use, but he wants to divorce her, so he would have to maybe also need chalitza. Maybe get's not enough, maybe also chalitza, because if she still has yibumim arishonim aleha, right, then maybe to disconnect, she needs to disconnect with chalitza. But here comes Rabbi Yossi Bar He says, no. He divorces her with a get. And not only that, fascinating halacha, machzira. If he divorces her, he can even remarry her. Again, this obviously means not if she married someone else in the interim. We've already learned you can't ever do that. But the point is, even though you might think he, he, he's marrying his brother's wife, right? That's forbidden. It's only permitted because of Yibam. 
Once he fulfills the mitzvah of Yibu, maybe he can't marry her again if he divorces her. Comes to Allah and says, no, no. With him, the Esh at Ach is gone, basically. Okay? So she's basically his wife at this point. So now they say, Hatamnami, Lema, why didn't you say the same thing here? Vyibma, Adayi Bumima, Rishonima, Laviti, Bai, Chalitza. Really, it's two questions. In fact, there's different versions of what the question is. Is the issue here that it's Chalitza, that she would at least need Chalitza if she's still considered Ruvain's widow, then she needs to do Chalitza to get out of the marriage with Shima. Or also, maybe she can't remarry him because she still got Yibum of Reuven and she did the Yibum and, and therefore she shouldn't be allowed anymore. So, in any case, these questions are drasha v'yibma. We're going to have this structure of what's going to happen here, which is there's you know, one pasuk which says v'yibma, she still got Yibum upon her. But here... She's considered really Shimon's full-fledged wife for all intents and purposes and no longer connected to Reuven because of a different drasha. Because it says, and he takes her for a wife, which was the first part of that phrase, right? V'yibma tells you she's still got some yibum from Reuven. Lekachalolisha means she's his full-fledged wife. So obviously this is a little arbitrary, right? Why add that one and, and, and take away that one, right? Why are we basically splitting, and that's going to be a structure we're going to see again in today's stuff, which is, right, where there's one part of the verse, which is including something, one part, which is not including something. So, um, if you're going to say, she's then we should say that she doesn't have the Yibam of Reuven on her anymore. Right? This is kind of, either go with this or go with that. How can you go with both? So they say, the obvious answer, which is, right, we've had this many times, where well, one word is coming to say Yibma, she's still got Yibum. The other word, the Kachalu Lisha, means she's a full-fledged wife. So when it comes to the get and, and the, right, that we're going to view her, she doesn't need Chalitza. But when it comes to the issue of Eshtachiv Shaloya Bolamo, we're still going to consider her Ruvens, right? Ruvens Yivama, in which case she can never marry Levi, who was born after Ruven died. So then the Gemara is going to ask the obvious, which is Maraita. Why did we, it's almost arbitrary. Why did we say, that's the one we're going to say, for this issue, she still is connected to Ruvain. For the other issue, she's not connected to Ruvain at all. So, When it comes to the Easter of Eshet Ach, there's an Easter of Eshet Ach. We allow it because of Yibum, but Eshtachiv Shalayab Olamo was forbidden, so we're going to keep that forbidden. When it comes to hetera, in other words, allowing her to be divorced with a get, so that we're going to keep within the hetera. Okay, that, um, like, the issue of get generally permits a woman. So we're going to keep that as that one works, but when it comes to eshtachiv shalaya balama, because that was forbidden, we're going to keep that forbidden. Okay, so therefore, that's their answer. It's not as random as you thought, and now we're going to move on to a question of Rabbi Shimon. So that was all a question on the rabbis. Reasoning. Now we're going to ask a kind of bit of a bizarre question, I'll have to agree, um, on Rabbi Shimon, because they're kind of creating an abs- a case that will create an absurd question. And the Gemara is going to kind of ask, that's a bit of an absurd question, but we'll see. So, the Rabbi Shimon da Amar, Ho'ilu Metza'a Behetel, Velo Amda Alav Sha'a Achat Be'isul, if his whole theory is that when Levi was born, she was married to Shimon, and, and it was perfectly legitimate for her to be married to Shimon. And now that Levi is born under Shimon's, you know, marriage to her, then Shimon and Levi are achim that were together, right, yachdav, and therefore if Shimon were to die, she can basically marry, do yibum to Levi. So the whole logic is since Shimon married her fair and square, and Levi was born fair and square when she was married to Shimon, so we're going to view this all through the Shimon lens. So now they say, Elameata, what about this case? Okay, and I'm going to put the case up. It's a little bit strange the way the case is told to us because the case is told to us in a way that we don't really understand the case. Like, they're going to talk about something that doesn't really make any sense. Like, you'll have to see as it goes on, okay, how this works. One second. Um, okay. So now, here's our case. Ahoto Meimo. Okay, we don't have a sister yet in the picture, so just wait for that part. Okay, we're going to have someone who's a sister through the mother, but we're not there yet. It's only going to be described as we go on. Usually the cases start and they already describe and you get it from the beginning. This is kind of explaining something from the end of the story at the beginning, so just wait. 
So before this sister from the mother was born, Nisa'a Achiv Me Aviv. Okay, we're going to have this woman, Dina, who's going to marry Reuven. Okay, so basically we have two separate marriages, two separate children. They have no connection to each other whatsoever. So Reuven marries Dina. Okay, uh, an average marriage, two people who have no connection to each other. Now what happens? Well, Dina's father either dies or divorces his wife. Okay, this is not going to be a Yibum situation yet. So he just isn't married anymore to her mother. And her mother marries Reuven's father. Okay, so basically the couple then married to each other, their parents end up getting married. Okay, that's pretty simple so far. Then what happens? That new couple, right? So again, you have they're married and they're married. Okay, now that couple has a child. Okay, that new couple who's basically the father of the groom and the, and the um, I'm just calling the bride and groom, but the married couple. Okay, so the father of the husband and the mother of the wife have a child. So now let's go back and read it from the beginning. Achoto me'imo. So Shimon, this new child, is, right, Dina is his sister from his mother, and Reuven is his brother from his father. So his half, his half brother is married to his half sister. Okay, that's the easy way to say it. Okay, so Achoto me'imo is aviv me'achiv me'aviv, right? So first, again, before he was born, and this is where we're going to go because it was all happened. They weren't connected before he was born. Only when he's born is there some connection here. Charkach nolad ach. And then what happened? Umet. Ruvain dies. Now what's going to happen? Dina is going to fall to Yibum, to Shimon, right? And basically the Gemara is going to say, Titiabem, she should do Yibum. Why? Ho il ubao behetel. Because when Shimon was born, this couple was totally legit, fair and square. They were allowed to be married to each other, right? And Shimon wasn't even there. Now that Shimon comes into the picture, now again, it's not a fair comparison. But what they're saying is this would be absurd. She obviously can't do even to Shimon because they're siblings. They're half, right? It's her half-sister through his mother. So there's no way he could possibly do that. But if you say, ho il right, meaning... Dina and Reuven had a perfectly good marriage. They weren't related in any way, shape, or form before Shimon was born. So maybe you would think that you could say the same thing. Now, it's, it's not a fair comparison. It's not exactly the same thing. But right now, they're going to kind of suggest that maybe it is the same thing. Okay? So it's a bit of a weird question. To which the Gemara says, <laughs> How can you just ignore, like you're suggesting that this would work? Of course this can't work. It's his sister. Of course you can't marry his sister. You can't just throw his sister's arayot out the window. So they retort back. Rabbi Shimon is throwing an erva out the window. Because what's he saying? He's saying when she was married to Ruvain, remember our basic case, he was, and then Levi was born after Ruvain died. That's erva. That brother is eshet ach. That's not permitted because of yibum, and he should be forbidden forever. And Rabbi Shimon overrides that. So why wouldn't he theoretically override this? Which again is tried to, to say, of course that would never override. But the logic would say your logic is going to take us to crazy places. That's what he's basically saying. So the Gemara says, no, no, no. Isur eshet achiv is not the same as isur achoto. Why eshet achiv shelo ayaba olamo? This little brother being born is not the same thing. Why the issue of the sister will never be overridden. Why? Because there's never permission for someone to marry his sister. Never. Right? There's no case where we're going to permit that. But but a brother, generally, is always overridden for Yibam. So while it's true that it was for Reuven, again, Rabbi Shimon goes back to his approach, which is Eshet Achiv could be overridden sometimes. I'm going to override it here as well. Because again, as relates to Shimon, it's an eshtachiv shahayaba olamo. He was alive and therefore not. So they kind of took his logic and tried to say it's ridiculous because you come to these ridiculous conclusions to which he said you're comparing two different things. They're not, it's not a fair comparison. A sister is not the same as your brother's wife because your brother's wife is generally overridden for Yibam. So I'll extend it to eshtachiv shahayaba olamo in a case where the brother was alive when the second brother was married, in which case now that the second brother died, we go according to that and we don't look backwards at what happened with Ruvain, and that I'm willing to be matir, I would never permit, obviously, a sister. Okay. Next Mishnah. This Mishnah is going to a little bit go back and then go forward. 
Okay, there was a general principle they said about Yivaman. This is kind of a review in one line of what we learned so far. Right, if you can sum up 20 pages of Yivama or 18 pages of Yivama like this. Any situation where there's erva, right, by Torah law, she doesn't do yibum and she doesn't even need chalitza, right? She's permitted. Her tzara, her second wife is permitted, right? There is no yibum or chalitza. But category number two, we're going to have three categories. One is going to be no chalitza, no yibum. The next is going to be we make you do chalitza, but you can't do yibum. And the third category is going to be you can either do yibum or chalitza. So the second category is called Isor Mitzvah the Isor Kedusha. Okay, I don't even know how to translate it, but something forbidden that's a mitzvah, something forbidden that's Kedusha. We don't yet know what this means. We're going to leave it for another minute. I'm going to leave you in suspense, but one more minute we'll explain because the mission is going to explain itself. In these cases, if it's forbidden because of a mitzvah or forbidden because of Kedusha, because of sanctity, then she does Chalitza and Na'ibu. Achota Shehi Yivimta Okay, let's go back now to our charts. What is achotashi vimta? We actually had this case in the end of Yud Chenemubet. We have three brothers here. And this is just an example, okay? Um, Levi has a son called Amram, okay? And then there's Leah and Rachel who are sisters. So we have three brothers, three sisters, and one brother has a, has a son. One of the sisters marries the son, okay? Then... They get divorced or he dies or something happens. They're not married anymore. And then she decides to marry her husband, her previous husband's uncle, which is fine. That's not a problem. She can't marry a son and his father, right? That's kalato. The father can't marry the daughter-in-law, but she could marry his, his uncle if she wants. So she marries his uncle. And then the other sister marries the other uncle, Shimon. So we have Leah married to Reuven and Rachel married to Shimon. So two sisters married to two brothers. And then what happens? Both brothers die. This is a case we've seen where the achayot become yivamot, right? They're both going to fall to yibum now to Levi. What have we said in the past? There's Zika, right? Levi now is supposed to marry two sisters. He can't. So, and it's called achotzekukato. He's supposed to marry the sister of the woman he's already got a yibum, you know, uh, relationship to. He can't marry any one of them. But what we're going to see now is if Sorry, my thing is blocking. You probably see it. Okay. So if, here, let's just go back. Leia now, the issue is like this. They both fall to Levi, so theoretically it should be a problem. However, Leia can't marry Levi. There's no Zika between Levi and Leia because Leia is Levi's daughter-in-law. Okay. Even though she's not now, but she was at some point and that ever remains. So he can never marry anyone his son is married to. So since Leah is prohibited to do Yibam with Levi, Rachel becomes permitted. So even though normally two sisters fall to Yibam to the same peop- the same brothers, they can't do Yibam in this case. So again, let's read it inside. So she is allowed to do Yibam. Okay? That's basically the, the situation. So now, now what we want to... So again, we had... First category, can't do Yibam or Chalitza, that's Erva, that's all the things we learned before, and therefore she can go get married to anyone she wants right away. Second is this Isra Mitzvah, Isra Kedusha, which we're going to explain in a second, where you do Chalitza, but not Yibam. And the third is, where there could be a case with Achota, Shivim Ta, where she could do Yibam or Chalitza. And that's the case we just explained. Isor mitzvah, what is this? The Mishnah continues. Shniya Midivrei Sofrim. This we're going to get to tomorrow, all the details. All sorts of rabbinic arayot, meaning it's not forbidden by Torah law, but it's forbidden by rabbinic law. Now you understand why you do chalitza na yibum. Because on a Torah level, you can actually do yibum because it's not a forbidden relationship. But on a rabbinic level, you can't marry them because it's forbidden on a rabbinic level. So instead of yibum, you do chalitza. Second category, isur kedusha. This category is what we call Isur Lav. These are things that are forbidden on a Torah law. They're not like the previous category, which was only rabbinic. They're forbidden by Torah law, but only a lotase. You can't marry them because it's a lotase, but there's no kare, there's no court imposed um, death penalty. It's a more lenient, okay? This is a widow to a high priest. 
a divorcee or someone who did chalitza with the Kohen Gadol. There's also other people like a Zona and other things. A mamzer, okay, mamzerim can't marry each other. So if either the, right, um, a mamzeret fell to Yibum to a regular person or a, a woman fell to Yibum to a man who was a mamzer, then, or a natin. What's a natin? These were the people, they were called the givonim in the time of Yoshua, and they faked out uh, Yoshua. They pretended their clothes were, were old and all this, and they, they ended up, Yoshua made a breed with them, even though he wasn't supposed to, and then he, he ended up, they had to be, they ended up being our, our water, like our, they drew the water for us and things like that, and they ended up converting, but they made a gzera. They're called natinim because it says, vayitinim, he, made, he put them into to become our water collectors, etc. So he, so because of that, they're called nitinim from the word vayitinim, and they're not allowed to marry into the community. Okay, so these people can't marry in. So what if you fall to yibum to one of them, or you're one of these people who falls to yibum to one to a regular Yisrael? So in all these cases, it's an isur lav. Okay, it's a lo tase to get married to them. So in this case, we basically say. Right? She does chalitza because there is a mitzvah of yibum, just not, just you can't do it through marriage because you're, it's forbidden to marry them. Okay, we're going to get to why specifically they are obligated in yibum. So, klala tu yemai. First, the Gemara starts off with this first word, which you probably didn't really pay attention to, which is klal amru b'yivama. There was a general rule they said about a yivama. We're now going to have the same, we're going to have the sugya in parallel, two different versions. And they're going to actually come to opposite conclusions about a derivation they're making from the first line of the Mishnah. So the first version is that why is, what's the word klal coming to include? La tuye mai. It must be coming to include something additional. Ah, it's to tell you not only a rayot, but even the tzara of an ailonit, of a woman who can't have children. Remember this woman who's in a specific category of a woman who can't have children. She has no signs of puberty, never, never anything. Uchi de Rav Asi. And according to Rav Asi, that basically her tzara, even though she's not Arab, it wasn't forbidden for her to marry her husband. It's not forbidden for her to marry, sorry, it's not forbidden for her to marry another person, but there's no yibum for her because she can't have children. And the whole idea is to have children. So therefore, right, the whole idea of yibum is to, right, to lahakim et shem amet. So therefore, her tzara is, is basically doesn't need chalitza either, just like the erva, it's to include an additional case. And that's like Ravasi. The Ikad Amre, some people say, Koshi Sura Isurva, which is a quote from the Mishnah, although you'll see it's not a direct quote from the Mishnah. If you see in the Mishnah itself, if you have a regular Gemara in front of you, there's a little aleph by the words Koshi Isurva. Clearly there was a different version of the of the Mishnah which read like this. Koshi Isura Isur Erva. Okay, which is very similar. It's just different words a little bit. But any kind, any time where her isur is erva, who asira tzarata? That's when her tzara doesn't need yibum either. But ha lo asira isur erva. This comes to exclude if it's not erva. It's only one whose isur is erva. They're ignoring the word klal. They're saying we're going to learn it from here. Only if it's erva does she exclude the tzara, which means what? The opposite. From here you can learn tzarat I lo need right. So uh what does this come to exclude? I'm a rat from the Mu'ute Tzarat Ailonit Ulit Loke Rav Asi. So according to this version, it comes to say we do, our mission doesn't hold like Rav Asi because it's only Erva and nothing that's not Erva. So the Tzarav and Ailonit would actually have to do Chalitza or Yibum, right? She would be obligated as opposed to the first way of reading it, which was that was to include that case. Today is a lot of including, excluding, which one do we include, which one do we exclude, a lot of this back and forth. Going now to the Achotah Shivim Takes, Achotah Deman, sister of what kind of erva are we talking about here? Ile Mati Isor Mitzvah, if you want to say, remember what happens, since the sister can't marry the brother, the other sister is allowed to do Yibum. So if you say the sister, in what way is she forbidden Isor Mitzvah? Maybe it's only on a rabbinic level. Well, Kevan Demita Orai Taram Yekame, Pagaba Achot Zkukato. Since if it was only Erva Bida Rabbana, not like the case we saw. The case we saw was his daughter-in-law, that's Mido Oraita, Torah law. But let's say it was only rabbinic law she was forbidden. That would mean, again, when you have rabbinic law, you have to view things also from a purely Torah level. On a purely Torah level, she would have to do Yibum because she's not forbidden whatsoever. So if that's the case, Pagaba Chotzukato, on a Torah level, 
he's actually now supposed to marry two sisters. Only because the rabbis came in is one dropout. But on a Torah level, he's supposed to marry both. And then he should basically not be able to do Yibam with either one of them. And therefore, it must be, we're talking about only the Torah law ervas uh, with the sister. So now they say, okay, wait. We now want to know, first, okay, we're going to do two things here. One is, where do we get from the word Isor Mitzvah that that means Durabanan, right? Arayot Durabanan, and how do we know Isor Kedusha means Isurei Lotase? Okay, that's the first thing we're going to do. And then, we're going to bring a different version which flips the definitions. Rabbi Yehuda thinks that Isor Mitzvah is Lotase, negative ones, and Isor Kedusha is the rabbinic arayot. Okay, so we're going to have a flip and then we're going to have to explain his logic. Like, where do they get it from the words? So again, let's look inside. Isor mitzvah shniot. Am I kari le isor mitzvah? Am rabbi mitzvah l'shmo l'divrei chachamim. Anything rabbinic, it's a mitzvah to listen to the rabbis. So we'll call it isor mitzvah, which means, right, it's isurim that are a mitzvah because they're a mitzvah to keep them because the rabbi said it and it's a mitzvah to keep what the rabbi said. Isor kedusha, manah l'kohen gadol grusha l'chadutza l'kohen idiot. Am I kari lehu isor kedusha? Dichtiv kedoshim yu l'elohem. Because it says in the Psukim about the Kohanim, you're supposed to be sanctified to your God. And then it says, don't marry this one, don't marry that one, don't marry that one. So there you see this juxtaposition between Kedusha and not marrying people. Tanya, Rabbi Yehuda Machlif. But according to the Braita, Rabbi Yehuda flips. Okay, he says, Isra Mitzvah, Amana Kohen Gadol, Rushava Chalutza Kohen Adyot. Why does he call this Amai Kari Le Isra Mitzvah? Dichtiv Ela Mitzvot. In that section, it also says, right at the end of the section, it says, Elam Mitzvot, this is actually at the end, toward the end of Sefer Vayikra. It says, these are the mitzvot, which were all these sorts of mitzvot that related to Kanim and it relates to a whole bunch of things. These are the mitzvot that God commanded to Har Sinai. And from there, they said, ah, that refers to this. They're called mitzvot. Isur Kedusha, Shniyot Midivrei Sofrim, Amai Kari Le Isur Kedusha, Amar Abaye, Kol HaMakeim Divrei Chachamim, Nikra Kadosh, Abai says, anyone who keeps the words of the rabbi is called sanctified. Now, the word sanctified is not exactly the opposite of, right, someone who does a mitzvah and the opposite of someone who doesn't keep a mitzvah. That's, but sanctified sounds like you're above the law almost, right? It sounds like you're a chassid, like you're someone extra special. So, so Rava doesn't really like this. I'm really Rava. The opposite of kadosh is not rasha evil person, but someone who doesn't listen to the rabbis is an evil person. So if you say someone who listens to the rabbis is sanctified, but if you don't listen to the rabbis, you're just kind of average, well, that's not true, right? You have to listen to the rabbis. If you don't listen to the rabbis, you're an evil person. So kadosh is not really the term you should use for someone who listens to the rabbis. So I'm a, so Rava says, Rava, kadesh lecha. What do the rabbis do when they make these or, these decrees? They make the decrees in order that, right, Kadesh Atzmecha, sanctify yourself, b'mutar lecha. In other words, the Torah says this is forbidden, and you should also forbid this, right? Go forbid more so that you don't come to accidentally go against Torah law. And that's what we call sanctify yourself, okay? So because it says sanctify yourself, b'mutar lecha, or because that's, that's a law that we believe in, right? You should... That's what the rabbis are doing when they do this. So that's why rabbinic law is called Isurei Kedusha. Because there are ways of, right, the whole reason we're going to see who all these shniot are, and the reason they said you can't sleep with these people are because we're worried if we allow that, you might allow a closer relative. Um, so we now had two different versions of what Isurei Mitzvah and what Isurei Kedusha is. Now, even though we're still on Amad Aleph, we're now going to start a sugya which is going to basically take us to the end of, of the daf today. Almanah the Kohen Gadol. So now we're going to focus on this Almanah the Kohen Gadol case and the whole last part of the Mishnah, which is basically saying, in this case, where it's in Yisur Lav, what are we going to say? You can't do Yibum, right? You can only do Chalitza, but you can't do Yibum. Okay? You're not allowed to marry because it's Yisur Lav. We don't... Yeah. Gemara's going to have a big question with this. First, they're going to infer something from the Mishnah. In general, yibum is you perform yibum if a man was married to a woman, dies childless. But not only if he was married, if he was halachically engaged. Again, halachically engaged, you always have to remember, is not our engagement today. If a couple gets engaged, they don't need to get if they break their engagement. Okay, we know that to be the case. But in those days, 
they used to do Eirusin in a different way. What we do under the chuppah, they would do often a year before. And if you want to break the Eirusin, you need to get. If you die childless from the Eirusin, the woman needs to do chalitza or yibum. So the Gemara says, kapasik vitani. The Mishnah didn't specify, are we talking about from marriage or from engagement? Therefore, we're going to assume lo shnamina nisuin velo shnamina eirusin. Shouldn't matter whether it's marriage or divorce or uh, engagement. So bishlamah mina nisuin. I get in nisuin why you can't do yibum because now we're going back to a sugya we learned in the beginning of the masechet. We've spent a long time on nisuin aseva lo tase. Right, yibum is a mitzvah ase, but not marrying an almana. And a Kohen Gadol can't marry an Amana for two reasons. There's a mitzvah ase associated with it, a positive and a negative. What is it? So the negative commandment is you can't marry an Amana. It says it in the Torah. You can't marry a, a woman who's a widow. But it also says in the Torah, Isha bivtu leha yikach. You have to marry specifically a woman who's a virgin. That's a special halacha for a Kohen Gadol. Now, obviously, an Amana is generally not a virgin because she's been married to someone. However, if she's engaged, then she is still a bitula. Okay, because engagement doesn't permit you to have relations. So therefore, we're going to say like this. When they're married, I understand. I say velotase, right? The, the commandment not to marry an almana is both a positive and a negative. In which case, an ase doche lotase vase. You can't have the positive commandment of yibum override an ase and a lotase. But remember what we learned. An ase can override a lotase unless it's karate. This isn't karate. So... So, Elamina Erusin, Lotase Gredehu. Yavoase, Vietche Lotase. It's just a Lotase then. The Ase should override the Lotase. Okay, that's the Gemara's question. And that's a big question that we're going to have five answers to. Some of the answers are going to say they're going to split into two categories. Some are going to say there's a special Drashami de Oraita that's going to basically say by Torah law there's no Yibum for this kind of relationship. It doesn't override because of some special something in the Torah. And some are going to say, on a Torah level, it works. It's just a rabbinic decree, okay? And the rabbis forbade it for some particular reason. So we're going to start with that it's Torah. Amar of Gidol Amarav, Amar Kav, Alta Yivim Toh Hasha'ava. This is the pasuk with Chatzba Chalitza, and it says, Im lo yachpotza ish lakachet et Yivim Toh, if he doesn't want to take her as a wife, Valta Yivim Toh Hasha'ava, then the Yivama goes to the gate where the guard, where the, where the, um, the court sits, and et cetera. The word Yivim To is repeated twice here. If he doesn't want to ca- uh, take his Yivim To, then Ba'alta Yivim To Hashavah. So it could have just said Ba'alta Hashavah. You would know exactly who we're talking about. We just mentioned her a second ago. So they're going to say, She'en Tamu Lomar Yivim To. That's an unnecessary word. Ma Tamu Lomar Yivim To is to say, Yesh Lecha Yivama Achat Shola Lecha Litza Vamala Libum. There's one type of Yivama. There's one exception to the rule. That's normally, Im Loyach Potz means, if she doesn't want to do yibum, you do chalitza, meaning chalitza is only when there's a potential to do yibum. But there's one exception where there is no potential to do yibum, and yet we do chalitza. And what's that? That's our case. Okay, so it's a it's what we call almost a zerat It comes from the Torah. It's just, you know, a drasha, you have to just take it. Okay, that's anyone who's forbidden only by a lotase, so we make them do chalitza. So now they question and they say, and once you're going to say there's a Pasuk that includes, maybe it should include even people who are forbidden kare. And maybe we should undo everything we learned in the last 20 dapim or 18 dapim and say, if it's kare, we make you do chalitza. So, Amar Kra, Im Hachafetz, Miyabim, just like we saw before. There was one Pasuk which went one way, one Pasuk that went the other way. Well, it says, if you don't want to marry her, do yibum, then you do chalitza, which seems to imply Right? Only hachafetz biabem. If you wanted to, you could. So kol olel yibum olel lechalitza. V'kol shein olel yibum in olel lechalitza. You have to be potentially in the world of yibum to be able to do chalitza, other than obviously this one exception that we just said. But so ihachi chayve lavim nami. So they say, wait. If you're going to say this is the principle, then the principle should exclude chayve lavim. So they say harabe yibim to. In other words, we have two things pulling. One is saying. Only when you can do yibum can you do chalitza. And the other one's saying, well, yibim to includes some additional case. So we're going to include chayve lav. So the Gemara is obviously going to ask, like we asked earlier, similar structure. Umar ra'ita. Why include chayve lavim and not chayve kritu? Maybe it's to include everything. And that all these things that we've been learning all along, maybe they need chalitza to get out of it. 
which actually is somewhat logical, right? In fact, someone asked it after class one day, saying, well, why don't you just make them do chalitza, right? What's the big deal? I mean, even though chalitza is a bit of a big deal, but, um, but, so now they say, turning on to Amabet now, mistabra chayve lavim tafsibu kiddushin. Chayve kritu lo tafsibu kiddushin. This was all learned out from the words, ulekacha lo liisha, right? In other words, it says that, sorry, um lo yachpot ha'ish lakachat et yivim tov. He doesn't want to marry. That means there has to be some potential marriage in there. When it's karet, and a woman, let's say the man decides to marry a woman who's forbidden by karet, there's no marriage. Even if he marries her and he says, hareya mikudesh li, and he does everything right, it's as if there's no marriage because it's it's so forbidden. But chayve lavim, if you marry a woman anyway, against the law, the marriage is valid. So therefore, since we ha- we're learning it from this verse that talks about if you don't want to marry her, there has to be some potential to marry her, actually. So therefore, it must be chayve kritu, it must be chayve kritu that are on the outs and chayve lavim are on the ins, which again teaches us if it's only chayve lavim, then it's, um, you would do chalitza. So, so far, we're okay with this answer. However, Rav is going to question this and say the following. What this basically means, and I want this to be very clear, this is going to raise a question. If you say it's a law midor, right? What you're basically saying is, by Torah law, there's absolutely no potential for yibum for a chay velavim, but there is potential for chalitza. It's this one exception, right? Where there's no, there's no yibum on a Torah level, but there is chalitza on a Torah level. It's this unique exception from this drasha of yibim to. So Mati Rava, wait a minute. Rava says, here's a bright time. Isur Mitzvah be Isur Kedusha, okay, which Isur Kedusha is what we were talking about, or Isur Mitzvah, depending on whether you're Rabbi Yehuda or the rabbis, but they're both included here. Ba'aleha o chalatzla niftera tzarata. Now if she has a tzara, right, let's say the, the woman has a tzara. Now the tzara is in Isur Lav to the person, let's say. So if ba'aleha o chalatzla niftera tzarata, if he ends up doing yibum with her, or he does chalitza with her, the tzara is exempt. Now, that shows that yibum has validity on a Torah level. And we just said there is no such thing as yibum. So if you were to do it against the law, it shouldn't work at all. And this is saying it's actually effective. So that basically knocks out the opinion that on a Torah level, that there is no yibum. Because there, and there is chalitza, but there is no yibum. Because then if you did it, yibum shouldn't work at all. So, Isa Kadata Chai Velava Mito Raita Lechalitza Ramya Liyibum Yo Ramya. If you want to say this, Rasha is telling you, this is a case that has no place in the realm of Yibum, but yet has Chalitza. Well, then it shouldn't work. Kibaaleha Amai Nifterat Zarata shouldn't work. So, who Motiv Lavu Mufarik La Rava brought this question, but he himself is going to answer it. You could potentially read this Brayta as Litzda Din Katani. You could split it into two. It talked about Isor Mitzvah and it talked about Isor Kedusha. Isur Mitzvah was Arayot de Rabbanan, and Isur Kedusha is Isur Elav. So you could say, Ba'aleha, if he actually does even with her, that's relating to the Isur Mitzvah, because there, on a Torah level, you can marry her. It's only rabbinic level, it's forbidden. So then the Yibam will work. Ba'chalatzla is a Isur Kedusha. On our case, Isur Elavim, it would only be if Chalatzla, it would exempt her tzara, but not if you did Yibam. So that's one way to resolve it. The problem is the next source is not going to be able to be explained that way because the next source is only going to be talking about Chai Velav. Mativ Rav. Ptsua Dakao Kuchupcha. This is someone who has either crushed testicles or, or his penis is, is severed, some sort of problem. And the Sri Saddam, which is somebody, a human castrated the person. Vahazakain. These are all people who can't have children anymore. Zakain, we're talking about someone who is incapable of having children at this point. Ol Cholzim Omiyabmi. So they can either do chalitza or yibum, even though they can't really have children, right? But they can do either chalitza or yibum. So ketzad, how would this work? Because you're not allowed now. A pitzua da kana are not allowed to marry. Okay, there's, a, there's an isor lav about them. So let's far, try to figure this out. Meitu v'lahem achim v'lahem nashim. If these people died and they had brothers or they or they had and wives, and they did ma'amar, v'natnu get v'chatsu, masha asu asu. If they did ma'amar, plan to marry them, and then they gave them a get, and then they did chalitza, it works. V'im ba'alu, kanu, and if they were to have had relations with them, it would have worked. Meitu achim v'amdu heim, this is more relevant for us. If the brothers died, and then they were left to do, the wives were left to do yibam or chalitza with these people that are asur to marry them, Okay, again, this is a little different from the Zakein, who's not actually a soul, but the, let's say the Ptsuat Akan Kuchufcha that are forbidden, 
Okay, so this Kruchufcha Ptu Adaka does Ma'amar with the woman. V'natnu gero shechatsu, mashasu asu. Okay, so if they then give a get and they do chalitza, it would work. Or ve'im ba'alu kanu. And if they have relations with them, it would work. What do you see here? Isur lav, yibum, is effective. Even though you're not allowed to, it's effective. And there's an additional thing, which is asur kaiman. Let's say you did yibum, had one act of sexual relations, you would have to divorce them immediately because it says, Mishum Shanemar, He can't come to Hashem. He can't marry a regular person in the community. Okay, I'm not going to get into this whole topic. We'll deal with this when we get into it more head on. It's not really the main topic of our of our daf today. But the Isal Kadata, There's no place for Yibum here. And that's basically anytime we're going to give an answer that this is on a Doraita level, we're going to have a problem with the source. Because it clearly says, if you do it anyway, it's effective. And if the whole idea is that on a Torah level, there is no Yibum, and yet there's Chalitza, it shouldn't be effective if you did Yibum. So that's, that was all the first answer and Rava's rejection of the first answer. He tried to reject it from some other source. He answered, but this source is very clear. Chai Lavim worked for Yibum on a Torah level, which would be a problem. So Ela Amarava. Rava says, Al manamina erusi nami First answer is to say, well, you said it's an ase and a lotase, right? And the ase should override the lotase. But there's also a mitzvah ase, even an amana from the erusin. It's not that he has to marry a, a virgin, it's something else. It says in the verses about the Kohanim, you have to be sanctified. Sanctified means marry the correct people. So therefore, there would be a positive and a negative, and that's why the mitzvah of Yibum doesn't override. To which the Gemara asks, but what about a mamzer and a natina? That all works with the Kohen Gadol and the Kohen Hedyod and all that, but it doesn't help you with the mamzer mam, mam and the natina. There's only a mitzvah uh, lotase. So, this is, by the way, in our Parsha that we just read yesterday, Parsha Shmini, and it's actually not in the context of Mamzer and Nitin. If you're wondering where were Mamzer and Nitin in the Parsha yesterday, it wasn't. It's in the section about the Shratzim and the creatures that you can't, that you can't eat in the Yurtame and all that, and about the kosher food and all that. It says, Vit Kadashtim. So they say that Pasik is giving you a mitzvah ase to sanctify yourself and not do lotases. Basically means there we get an ase and a lotase. So anyone who marries a mamzer also goes against that, and that's why the mitzvah ase of yibum can't override an ase and a lotase. To which the gemara has a great question. Ihachi kol tarak hula nami ase velotase hu dichti bitkadashem. Bitkadashem means sanctify yourself and do mitzvot. All mitzvot. That means any mitzvah lotase also has an ase, which means you'll never have this principle of ase override lotase, which means we could have erased a bunch of the dapim in the beginning of this mesecha, which basically tried to prove that rule. So that can't possibly be. That's not a good answer. So Ella Amarava, attempt number three for an answer. Gzera, now he moves out of the realm of Torah law. He says, ah, it's a gzera. Rabbinic ordinance. Almana mina erusim ata almana mina nisuin. We won't let an almana from erusim because if we allow an almana from erusim, we'll marry a kohen gadol. We'll think that almana from a marriage can also. So again, the Gemara is going to ask, what about a mamzeret and a tina? What are we worried about? If we allow a mamzer and a tina to marry when there's a mitzvah involved, people might think you can marry them when there's not a mitzvah involved. So now they're going to start asking a whole slew of questions that are absurd. Well then, we shouldn't allow yibam at all from the brother from the father because you can't do yibam with your brother through your mother. If you only share a mother, there's no yibam. And then it goes, it's just a regular Eshet Ach, Ereva. So if we're going to allow Eshet Ach from the father, maybe we should never allow Yibum because people might think you can marry your brother through your mother. So they say, no, no one's going to confuse that because Yibum benachal atalia, Rachmana. Yibum is all connected to when who you inherits you. We learned that already. And therefore, may Diyadi, everybody knows it only goes through the father. Ishasha in labanim lo we shouldn't allow Yibum with a woman who doesn't have kids, right? Whose husband doesn't have kids, because Yibum's not allowed in a case when the woman does have kids. So maybe you'll think that Yibum's allowed when she does have kids. So Bibanim Talia Rahman Mediata. Everyone knows Yibum's only because he doesn't have kids. No one's going to confuse that. Sorry, you shouldn't ever be allowed to do Yibum with a brother, even though he was alive at the time, because you might think, you might think maybe you could do Yibum with a brother that wasn't alive at the time. So they're basically saying, if you're worried about it, right, we could worry about a million things. No, so they say that also now. 
everybody knows that it's Kish Vuachim Yachdam and it's brothers that were living together, right? Even though you might think that one's less known. Maybe you'll say, don't ever let a woman do Yibam because in Ailoni can't do Yibam, so let's not let any women. To which the Gemara answers, Lo shricha. that's a very rare case. To which the Gemara says, what do you mean? Mamzerim and Nitin are Lo shricha. How common are Mamzerim and Nitin? Not the most common thing. So basically throws this one out the window because we shouldn't make a Gzera for, gzera for rare cases. So El Amar, Rav Gzera Bi Arishona Atu Biashniya. We're worried about the first Bia to the second Bia. Remember what we said. And they're going to bring up right to the prove it. If you did it, you did it, and it works, but you can't stay married to them. So if we allow, if we say it's effective the first, right, we allow it for the first one, people are going to think that you can stay married, and we don't want that. That's a good gzera. But Hadram, Rav, Rav actually rejects his own answer. Vitema Rav Ashi, love milti da amre da amarish lakish. I have a better answer. Rish Lakish says, "Kol makom shatam utzei asev lo tase. Im atay yachol kaim shnehem mutav im lav yavo asev yidchel lo tase." You only allow the asev to override the lo tase if we have no other choice. We have a, be- a great choice here. You could just do chalitza and still fulfill the mitzvah. So that's why we don't allow this. And that's a much better answer. Hachanami af shabah chalitza de mekayim asev lo tase. What's the problem with this? But then that means, again, there's no Yibum, there is Chalitza, there's no Yibum by Torah law, there's no Yibum by Torah law. Why did that source say, if you did Yibum anyway, it works? So the, the commentaries claim that we go back to answer number four, which is Gazru, Bi Arishona, Atu Bi Ashnia. So those were our five answers that we saw. We're going to continue a little bit. I think the, I think the next half connects a little bit more yeah, with this topic. That's it for today. Have a Shavuot Tov, everyone.